Hello everybody and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. As we head towards Thanksgiving and as the majority of subscribers to the channel are based in the US, I thought I'd share the recent webinar I did covering recent gyrocopter events and an overview of the very popular factory built Magni and Auto Gyro models which are gaining even more traction in the US as Auto Gyro in particular can be ordered as turnkey models. It also gives you a flavour of the webinar format, which are normally chargeable, but only to cover the Zoom platform costs because my events run for longer than the free subscription version will allow. I hope you find something of value in the film and look forward to seeing you on the next webinar, likely in a couple of weeks time. Now don't worry, it's not death by PowerPoint. This just gives me a broad framework to, to work to. So, Gyrocopter Bias Guide webinar and some news. Now, here's the agenda for the evening. Unfortunately, uh, so far this month has not been particularly kind to the Gyrocopter community. And I thought I'd give you uh, a little bit of insight or from what I know on some of the recent crashes, most of which have been fatalities. Uh, and then we'll dive straight in. So it'll be a quick overview of the two major companies uh, that are selling the big volume in factory built gyroplanes today. And then we'll break it up into the enclosed types, the open types, uh, and then we'll look at the engine options. Then we'll look at sales and service and then we'll have a Q&A. Now the Q&A, we might have, I think what I'm going to do is have a Q&A after each section and then at the end, a more generic Q&A. Otherwise, for example, if you wanted to ask me a question on an enclosed Cavalon, uh, you know, you might want to ask that after I've spoken about it rather than storing it up to the end. Okay, everyone with me, let's move on. So, uh, I suppose given the timing of all of this, which is slightly coincident, I mean, I don't know whether you uh, follow my channel all that relig religiously, but quite honestly, the last couple of films I've made <laughs> which have focused a little bit on some UK events has led to, you know, either handbagging or emotions. And I mean, it's ridiculous. So I sent a film to the channel basically to promote this webinar, basically, as I always do a few days ahead of the event, just to make sure anybody that wants to come comes Obviously it's good for me, there's no point me sat effectively at home talking to myself, but also as it happened that day, uh, a student, it was a student pilot basically, uh, he, he was on his second solo, uh, he got killed in Scotland. He was flying a Cavalon. So I'm told there's been some elements of rotor blades found away from the main aircraft wreckage. And given the age of the aircraft, it was the new, uh, for want of a better word, the new rotor system that allows 320 rotor RPM pre-rotation speeds. And the aircraft had got around 200 hours total time. Now I've flown aircraft with that rotor system with more hours on it than the accident aircraft and bearing in mind it is a student in the aircraft and he was on I think he was on his second solo so not to rule anything in not to rule anything out at this stage but I've advised the people that I am close to that fly Cavalon with that rotor system to ground themselves until they've spoken uh, in more detail uh, to Auto Gyro because it is a bit of an unknown. Now, again, 
I'll just reiterate, I've got no idea what's happened. And bearing in mind, it's a student on a very early solo. You know, anything can happen really from, you know, medical events, pilot error, aircraft maintenance problem, not maintenance, but aircraft mechanical problem. And then obviously the student just not being, you know, confident in dealing with it. Uh, you know, literally anything can happen. So the, uh, the UK Air Accident Investigation Branch, they'll be doing their work. The unfortunate thing really is that they won't probably publish a, a, a final report into this for, for a year. So I guess in the meantime, there'll be some element of speculation. In the meantime, uh, there was, well, prior to that in Kansas, there's been this MT Sport crash, uh, killer pilot and passenger. Again, no real news on the cause as yet, it's too early. But he was actually a commercial fixed wing pilot, uh, but he was relatively new to gyroplane. So again, you know, these things tend to have a common thread running through them. And usually when the MTSB or the AAIB or whoever the accident investigating authority is, comes to their conclusions, it tends to be no surprise when you read their conclusions. One thing that has concluded, people may remember a Cavalon that crashed in Czechoslovakia. And <clears throat> for those who may not know, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and share a new screen. So you might remember let me stop sharing again, share again. I'm not sure whether that, whether that works. Let's try this one again. So you might remember this accident where literally the Cavalon rotates through the uh, dual carriageway there. And what that looked like was, in the end, it ended up looking like this. Now, one interesting thing actually, and especially if we relate it to the accident in Scotland, where the suggestions that elements of rotor are not with the main airframe, can see here that that was quite a big hit and yet the blades certainly at the root you know uh, are, are well attached to the rotor head <clears throat> so this was a wreckage from that aircraft that came across the road and so it turns out again another student on a solo navigational exercise this time I think he'd done a longer route earlier in the day, dual with his instructor, and then repeated or was attempting to repeat the same thing. He has obviously had a bit of a, an impact himself as a pilot. He's okay, he's not uh, injured, uh, but he can't remember anything about the critical phase of the flight. The, there was a CCTV camera on the clubhouse that saw the aircraft line up, not using the entire uh, length of the runway. And, and in the end, it's, uh, it's ended up like that. So let me just do a little bit of... Uh, Ah, right, okay, yeah, okay, I hear you, Charlie. So just for those who can't see the chat that I can, uh, Charlie's telling me that uh, he probably won't investigate the Kansas accident uh, just yet uh, due to uh, the coronavirus. So, and it's not significant. So I'm not sure whether, do you, I mean, 
Do you think they'll investigate it later or they're just not interested full stop, Charlie? Uh, I'll come, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that in the Q&A. Uh, right, I am going to move on from the doom and gloom, but I just thought I'd give you a bit of color on what's been happening lately. And now we'll move on to the buyer's guide. So effectively, there are two big players in auto gyro uh, manufacturing. Magni from Italy and auto gyro from Germany. Now, there are others, most notably, uh, probably ELA, which is a Spanish manufacturer, although ELA don't particularly operate everywhere and they're not particularly well covered in all territories. Uh, there's obviously uh, more country specific. Uh, so like, for example, Silverlight you'll see in the States, but I don't know that Silverlight export in very large volumes elsewhere. There's Italian manufacturer uh, called Braco Gyro. There's some in Eastern European countries and there's some in Australia, although they don't tend to be everywhere. Whereas Magni and Autogyro are definitely across all territories and in fairness are probably the benchmark for, certainly for gyroplanes that come ready, kind of turnkey, shall I say, from the factory. So potted history, and obviously this is super brief. Magni started by a guy called Vittorio Magni. He was an aeronautical engineer initially with Augusta, and he built a Benson mainly for his own interest because he had a, just an interest in aviation. Uh, and then he formed VPM Gyro, which was then renamed as Magni. And originally he started using designs from Yuka Turbamaki, the Finnish designer. And now he's obviously done his own work. And the aircraft that you will more likely be familiar with from Magni, or Mani, I think, as they call it in Italy, are the open, they call it the Tandem Trainer M16 that we'll look at later, the M24 and M26, which is a very new aircraft, which are enclosed. Auto Gyro, based in Germany, the key person there is a guy called Otmar, Otmar Berkner, he has started the company with a model called the MT-03, which then migrated to be called the MTO Sport, and which is, well, I don't know why they call them the way they do, because for example, the MT-03 came out broadly 0506, then they changed it to the MTO Sport, which they now call 2010 Sport or Classic Sport because the new MTO Sport is called the 2017 Sport. I don't necessarily think that's a great naming convention just because it dates the aircraft quite quickly. They also build the Calidus and Cavalon. The key person there now is a guy called Jerry Spage. He's an English guy. He was originally the guy that bought the MT-03 to the UK uh, via his company called Rotorsport. But he is now the chief executive officer of the global company. And it's now got some private equity investment from, I believe, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So KSA is Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I think that was necessary because I think at one point uh, they were financially imperiled at the end of 2019. So that's the two companies that we've mainly focused on today in terms of 
uh, models. So if we move on to the enclosed types, and as you can see that this part of the PowerPoint presentation is not exactly feature rich, but the, but the M24 is a Magni aircraft and I will show you this is a Magni M24 and if you let me just grab this this is the Magni M24 and as you'll know or as you'll notice, should I say, uh, it sits on its tail. That's just a C of G thing. There's nothing broken. Um, it is a little bit of a pain because what tends to happen is when you get in or get out, or more likely, if you're going flying with a friend or a passenger, you put your friend, passenger, or wife, girlfriend in the aircraft first, and obviously they're managing this, uh, this attitude of the aircraft. It's also, again, the same effect when you get out of the aircraft. And if you get out of the aircraft first and then leave your passenger in the aircraft, obviously, as soon as they get out, the aircraft comes up and bashes them in the, in the legs. It's also a bit of a pain with ground handling because you're constantly uh, lifting the aircraft off the tail. Uh, in terms of the interior, that is a very basic uh, layout of M24. So that's how it would have been presented initially. And you fly M24 P1 from the left-hand seat, which is why you've got the basic pilot instrumentation on the left side and uh, circuit breakers, uh, magneto, starter, rotor brake and choker down here uh, and then all the engine instruments from mainly on this Rotax, it's what they call a flydat uh, system and the one upgrade they've done over the years is they've introduced more avionics on the panel. So you've now got a more kind of glass cockpit feel, dare I say. And they also have got an aircraft, uh, which I'm not, I can't remember the name actually. It's kind of M24 plus or, M, no, I think M24 plus is with, a, with the 915. They do one which is basically a bit more, the interior is a little bit nicer. Because if we go back here, this is all one molding with a sort of uh, plastic foam seat cover. And then here you can see this is a little bit nicer trimming. The one downside with this plastic molded interior, because the basic layout of the aircraft is you've got this straight keel uh, and mast structure, which is then got a glass fiber body mounted on top of the steel frame. So it's not a, it's not a monocoque like they use on Autogyro. It is a steel frame with the glass fiber body uh, mounted on top. The problem is when you look at the interior, the storage area is basically these bags uh, behind the pilot's seat. Now what I'm going to do is stop sharing this and share a I'm going to share that. Ah, yes, Bob. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, good, good spot. It's yeah, it is. It's called the M24 VIP with the nicer interior. This, as you'll see, is a different view. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to play this video in the background and talk over it. <clears throat> so uh, the interior, as you can see, doesn't have any possibility for luggage space. Uh, on the positive side with M24, you can see that what would be in automotive terms, the A-pillar. So what I mean by the A-pillar, 
is this structure here is very thin so you get very good vision and also when you looked at the front there you'll see that the side doors have got quite a quite a nice dome bevel which does allow pretty good vision uh, out of the side and downwards uh, you know it allows you sort of like a bubble you see on some helicopters it just allows a decent vision uh, out and downwards the other nice thing about Magni M24 is it's got very good access panels for the motor. It's something that when we look at uh, some of the Autogyro models, they have not been built to do daily inspection. Uh, up here, we're looking at the rotor. Rotor on M24 uh, is a composite rotor. Uh, it's the same rotor as on M60, it's quite heavy. The heavy rotor, uh, it does allow for a more pitch stable uh, design. I personally think that Magni aircraft are almost too stable. Once you've got comfortable with flying them, I almost think that they're too stable in actual fact. Propeller on M24 is fixed, fixed pitch. There's no adjustable prop option. And Basic all up weight, or sorry, the maximum all up weight, should I say, is 500 kilos. So let me just fast forward a little bit. Uh, just I think we've got access panels. There you go. So that's the access panel on one side open. You can see you can get your head in there. You can get a good uh, eyeball all around the motor. Uh, all around the uh, water header tank is just in there. Oil tank is down here. Uh, you can also see control rods. Uh, they're push pull. Uh, uh, they're just push rods rather uh, with rod ends and spherical bearings, which is different to autogyro, uh, which would be uh, cables. If I move around to the other side of the motor, it's going to give me an advert, isn't it? Because I've monetized the video. We'll wait for that to for that to do. But yeah, on the other on the other side of the motor, you can see that side gives you access to the turbo, sparking plugs, uh, throttle cables, and so on. So again, very good very good access to the to the motor for daily inspections and the hatch down here is to get eyeballs on the fuel tank so you can clearly see uh, your fuel state before you go flying and i think from that aspect the magni is head and shoulders better than any auto gyro auto gyro have not thought about that kind of uh, that element of, of the aircraft whatsoever. So if we go into the interior of the aircraft, you can see now more clearly that this is a this is actually a 2010 or 2011 aircraft, I think, and it's a it's in the original basic format, and you can see that you know you've got it's a very, it's a very harsh kind of uh, plastic molded interior cabin with this sort of foam uh, cushion seat. And because of that, there's no storage behind the seat beyond those bags we've looked at. There is some storage under the seat. Uh, pedals for the rudder are adjustable by little pins that you pull out and just literally move the pedals themselves you'll notice from this shot how in roll the stick on the right is higher than the stick on the left and that's because there's a joint that they basically connect to each other in the middle and then go backwards to the the, the rotor control and that means that when you roll uh, left the right hand stick raises and the left hand stick roll comes down. You can see that it's P1 from the left hand seat because you've got the pre-rotating lever here. 
And overall, I'm just pointing out in that, that basically that's the rotor RPM gauge in the middle. The, the biggest issue for me with M24 is stick force. The stick force for, well, the stick force for all magnets is, re is relative to autogyro high. But in the M24, uh, it's particularly high, actually. Um, and, and uncomfortably so, I think. Uh, usual gauges, so uh, airspeed indicator, uh, altimeter, vertical speed, and uh, then you've got the flight at uh, system in the middle. I don't really like the flight at, and that's mainly because I find that trying to read instruments on a, that are presented to me in a digital uh, perspective, I you can't scan them very easily. You've got to actually read them. That's an old Garmin that I'm pointing to. It's just an old navigational Garmin. And obviously that, uh, this is manifold pressure uh, down here. Uh, radio and transponder. That's the fuel pressure and fuel level. But the good thing is whenever you go flying, you really do want to try and get eyeballs on what your fuel state is. Just fast forward in the video, or I'm trying to get to the bit of the video where I just talk about the seat. There's some luggage under there. So you can see that is, apart from those bags behind the seat, that is, that's your lot as far as uh, storage is concerned. You could probably get a chart um maybe a bag a wash bag with a toothbrush in there and maybe a bottle of oil but not very much more to be honest with you um there are also oh there's another video more remote workers more security risks who are they no idea skip that so yeah that's your lot there's no similar uh under seat storage as i'm showing you here on the pilot side. The cabin ventilation is just there. It's a it's fed by a scoop in the roof, which is just cold air. And then at the front of the aircraft, there's also a couple of air intakes, which basically allow you to uh, gain either demist on the screen or cool airflow in the summer. Of course, in the winter, you tend to block them. This part of the video, I was trying to show the trim for the rotor because another thing that this aircraft is lacking is roll trim. And roll trim is done effectively by how you rig the aircraft initially which is fine, but of course, at some point, if you fly solo and then you fly uh, two up, then the uh, lateral weight is changing. And so that's never really in the position that you, uh, you know, that's, it's never in an ideal position, basically. Uh, there are the, I'm just trying to find the nose of this. Yeah, there you go. There are the, the vents for the fresh air into the cabin. And obviously this is just a radio, uh, a radio aerial. So that is pretty much uh, M24. Let's get back to our presentation. That's pretty much M24 as far as it kind of really, you know, relates to what we need to know. I haven't seen an M26, but M26 by Magni is their enclosed competitor for Calidus. I've never flown M26. I don't think anybody outside of the factory and maybe their agents have. 
looks kind of nice. Looks really like, a, I suppose, um, M22, which is an open aircraft, which has got these luggage lockers down the side. And uh, that aircraft's going to come out with, I believe, 915 power only. So that'll be an interesting thing to, to see when it comes out. Um, one thing that I didn't mention on the M24 was that, when I get there, sorry, back to M24. Yeah, the VNE on M24 is 100 miles an hour. So it's just a little bit of a uh, little bit of detail there. Let's just stop that. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, M24, does it have cooling issues? Charlie's asked me. Um, no, I don't think so. I, is there any reason that you think it might do, Charlie? Or, I mean, I'll caveat that a little bit from the fact that obviously I'm a Brit based in the UK and do most of my flying in the UK. And uh, look, I guess, to be honest with you, <laughs> to be honest with you, 25 degrees is tends to be, you know, a warm day in the UK in the summer even. I mean, obviously we get into the thirties, but it's not often. And of course we're always broadly somewhere around sea level. So, I don't think they've got any particular cooling issues. I mean, the, the, the engine, the pop, I'm going to stop this uh, share so I can see the question. Ah, uh, yeah, the Cavalon, uh, yeah, the Cavalon. Okay, I get, I see where we're going with this. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about Cavalon and, uh, and we can talk about the cooling. It doesn't, it doesn't particularly actually have any, uh, well, let's come on to that uh, now. So basically, we're talking about Cavalon. The, the issue mainly with the cooling uh, for Cavalon versus Magni is just the fact that Cavalon bodywork, the way the motor's packaged uh, versus M24, the, the bodywork is just so much tighter around the motor and you don't get cooling issues when you're in flight where you get cooling issues in Cavalon and Calidus to be fair which is the for the avoidance of doubt is is this aircraft the tandem enclosed is where it's a hot day you've given it a reasonable run you've landed and you've just got a cup of tea and then you want it to get going again. And they tend to get hot start problems or they can get hot start problems if it's a very hot day and you haven't really let it cool uh, down very well. So I've not really known anybody get completely and utterly kiboshed as in, you know, they haven't got stuck out somewhere, but they may have to have, just either cranked it a little bit longer or just hung around and had a second cup of tea uh, before they get going. Um, so that's, I mean, I was doing some flying over in Qatar. I was actually the chief pilot for their Coast Guard and they use um, gyroplanes in Qatar for uh, security and collaboration with their boats uh, that obviously work for the Coast Guard, uh, just in an observation role. And there was a Cavalon in Qatar. Now Qatar gets to 50 degrees and in flight that was getting marginal with Cavalon. I mean, it was get to be fair, it was getting marginal with, with MTO Sport, which they use, but, um, but yeah, so, it, for most of us, it's not really something to be that concerned about. But let's get into the detail of Cavalon with another 
another film. Let me just get this teed up and then we'll, we'll have a look what we can see. So, here we go. So I just play this like I did before. I'll play this in the background. So this is Cavalon. Uh, you'll notice straight away that the A pillars that I was talking to you about on uh, M24 are considerably larger on Cavalon. Uh, and that does mean you've got to move your head in order to get vision. So, for example, if you imagine we were sat where we are in relation to this Cavalon that was in the air, the, you know, for some of, you know, whether you actually P1 this aircraft uh, from the right hand seat, not the left. So you'd probably be visible. But, you know, if you're a little bit around, around to the to the right as we look at the aircraft uh, you disappear from view so you do have to move your head uh, with with Cavalon and as you can see uh, as the, the the rear bodywork is off this aircraft obviously and the body is carbon that's uh, not carbon it's a glass fiber composite monocoque and the tail and rotor mount into that monocoque. So the body is all one piece uh, and the tail, you can just see here, the aluminium tube of the tail plane bolts into, for want of a better word, this kind of stinger that's off the back of the monocoque and the rotor bolts to the body at those two bolt holes there. There's two big bolts that go through and bolt the mast to the monocoque. Now, when I said to you earlier about the packaging of the motor, you can see that with the bodywork off, when you put that bodywork on, just how tight a fit it is around those uh, around the motor. And you can see the coolers on this uh, are up here. This is the 915 uh, Cavalon. I think this is one of the first 915 Cavalons they built. Uh, it's got a 560 kilo maximum all up weight, Cavalon does, uh, which is a good 60 kilos more than M24, which is useful. You can also see there's a lot more ventilation via the door with Cavalon because Magni M24 doesn't have door vents, which is in the summer or in hot countries, that becomes a problem. And I mean, personally, I just think the styling of, Cal of Cavalon is, is just nicer fundamentally. Controls to the rotor are all push-pull. So they actually come off the controls through the center spine of the aircraft and then up to the rotor head here. Uh, this actually has got a hydraulic the adjustable prop uh, with 914. You get an electrically adjustable prop as an option, or you could take a fixed pitch prop if you if you wish. Uh, that's something that's not available on M24. And yeah, I think just basically it just looks a, a you know nicer thing. The one thing about the weight, I will say is that when you start getting to the 915 as this is, the extra weight of the 9, I mean, the empty weight of this, for example, I think was 340 kilos. And, you know, it means you've only got 220 uh, kilos of usable load. And bearing in mind, it's got a 100 litre fuel tank, kind of means that, you know, two reasonable size adults and you're done. So, you know, it's not like you're going to take a lot of luggage. I'll leave that plane. Someone's asked me a question. What's the question? Uh, 
Right, yeah, Peter asked about, so Peter's asking about the standard prop on the Cavalon. So the standard prop is a fixed pitch prop and all the other adjustable props, whether it be electrically adjustable or hydraulically adjustable, are cost, um, cost options. Now, I've got to say, the electrically adjustable prop was something called an Ivo prop, and I know people that have had getting on for four and five control units for that uh, for that prop. It's been a complete disaster for Autogyra. So, you know, I'm not entirely sure that I would want to take the adjustable prop option. Uh, there's going to be an ad in a minute, and then we'll carry on and see the interior of this thing. So, interior of Cavalon is pretty nice place to be, actually, in the sense that uh, pedals are adjustable by this little tag, so the whole thing just moves forward. The pedals just move forward on that carriage, so that gives you some good adjustability. That's the throttle and brake quadrant for the, in, for the pilot. There's an instructor throttle over on the on the other side. You can see that behind the seat, which is here, look, you've got a lot of you've got a lot of storage options behind the seat. Uh, and also on this kind of ledge behind the seat, uh, the headsets mount on the on the rear bulkhead. So you know, if you if you sort of, I mean, I'm, and that's the sunshade I was I was pointing at. I'm about five foot eight, five foot nine, so I'm not particularly the biggest guy in the world, um, and I have to have the seat quite quite upright and the pedals pull towards me. Uh, but guys over six feet fly these quite easily. Uh, in terms of the panel, this aircraft has got regular steam. Uh, instruments, so altimeter, vertical speed, um, airspeed indicator, 120 miles an hour VNE for the new Cavalons. It used to be 100, but it's now 120 miles an hour. So that's uh, you know quite useful, actually, quite a useful speed increase. The thing that I was talking about with this. Uh, this is like an iPad mount for navigation. And bear in mind that we P1 from the right-hand seat. What I was describing is if you, so these three instruments on the left are actually engine T's and P's. So they're water temperature, oil temperature, and uh, oil pressure. And if you mount that panel in landscape, you cannot see those instruments from the pilot seat without, you know, craning around and having a look. I think that's a bit of a poor design, uh, but you'll notice if you watch any of my other films, the panel options and fit for Cavalon are, I actually think it's borderline ridiculous, the number of options, you know, you can, you know, you can almost have what looks like a flat screen entirely in the middle and everything works off of, off of that. Um, the problem that that creates for the market is that, of course, you tend to transition onto an aircraft in one spec and then you get your own aircraft and we'll come on to the sales and service aspect later. But fundamentally, people fly their aircraft broadly without good knowledge of what they're looking at. And the, the number of variables is too great, in my opinion, for Cavalon. So I think if you, if you have a desire to buy one or fly one, then you've got to spend the time, and or my advice is spend the time to understand 
the instrument fit of your aircraft because in an emergency that will pay dividends just above where my hand is here this little box that actually says roll trim and that's the nice thing about Cavalon and all uh, auto gyro products now is that they've got roll trim now obviously in a tandem aircraft roll trim isn't so important but in a side by side uh, it's invaluable because it means you're not constantly having some stick input to keep uh, the aircraft level. There is also pneumatic pre-rotation, which is standard auto gyro type pre-rotation. And again, that means that there's no effort. The effort to pre-rotate in a Magni is reasonably considerable. Uh, what else can I tell you? I was about to show somebody a thing there. That is the, for anybody that flies fixed wing, that's what you'll recognize as a constant speed prop. So there's a constant speed prop unit with this 915 aircraft and it adjusts in a, norm, in a way that you would be uh, completely familiar with. That's, and that's a nice, things I have. Although this aircraft I think cost, I think it cost nearly 150,000 sterling. So it was not a cheap aircraft. Uh, the other thing as I've already mentioned uh, is it was quite a heavy aircraft at 340 kilos. So not a lot of room for, you know, two 2010 size geezers. This is a good little view of all of the room behind the seat. And this seating situation here, you could fly that as a six foot uh, tall guy and still have that kind of room for a, a smallish, actually, well, in terms of tallness, quite a large rucksack. In terms of that depth there, that's, that's a good 12 inches of depth, actually. So you get a, you'll get, and you've got the same the other side, so you'll get a reasonable amount of baggage uh, in there. Uh, moving around to the rear, uh, that's actually a stone guard for the prop. And yeah, I don't know what else I was pointing out really. It's general general chit chat about uh, about Cavalon. So look, I've got another touching wood. My over ah. Yeah, I, th I think actually, in fairness, part of the problem with the Ivo prop, as you uh, may know, Peter, is that I think people try and adjust it when it's already at maximum adjustment. So what they do, it, so, so when you've got an electrically adjustable prop, it's on a rocker switch. And what happens is clearly when you're taking off, you want the, the propeller fully fine and then you caution it off in flight. And people, they just, you know, they know that they're at the limit, but they just keep pressing it just to make sure. And I think it takes its toll on the controller. Um, but it, I know guys in the UK that have, literally they 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 they've almost prepared to set fire to their aircraft because they've had so many problems and of course typically with this kind of aircraft the owner is not really interested in doing any maintenance and actually it's probably not depending on how deep the problem is it gets beyond pilot maintenance um, and then it's always a, a huge faff uh, getting the thing to, 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 to someone who can service it. Okay, Calidus. Now, Calidus is probably what, I mean, I think Calidus is one of the nicest, uh, the nicest looking gyroplanes that, that you can buy. I think it's absolutely 
uh, fantastic. And I really, I really think it's the one that has driven uh, Magni to, to create the M26 rather than revising their uh, M24, if that makes sense. Because I think M24 could do with being updated and refreshed, but they didn't do that. They brought out M26 because I think this is something that Magni doesn't have and it's quite a popular model. It's very aerodynamic, as you can see, and that is really the, uh, the, the raison d'etre, if you like, of this aircraft is aerodynamic purity. And it's by far the fastest uh, gyroplane that's on sale right now. And, and what I mean by that is all auto gyros now have got 120 miles an hour VNE, but this will do 120 miles an hour. I mean, bear in mind, VNE is a, an absolute, not a target, but this will sit at 120 miles an hour and not really be at the limit of the motor, if that makes sense. It's just quite comfortable there. The problem, if there is a problem actually with uh, Calidus, is uh, the first one is to do with the canopy. And I've paused the video here because the one thing that's very impressive in actual fact is, are the optics through the canopy because that's a big piece of perspex and yet the vision through it is really, really consistent. Whoever makes the canopy for these aircraft and I don't know whether it's done in-house or externally, but they've done a really good job with that canopy. I mean, so actually, I'm, hats off to whoever's designed and built and, and manufactured it because they're, they're really good. They're really, really good. The one problem is that it's a massive sun trap. The old, uh, or rather the original Calidus, didn't have this sunshade to the roof. So if you were sat particularly in the rear uh, as a passenger, you were literally cooking, especially during the ground taxi to you know the active and doing power checks. It's just not, not pleasant. You can obviously see you've got uh, ventilation in the canopy, which works very, very well uh, when you when you when you've got airflow, but when, you, when you're stationary, the only thing you can do is crack the canopy and hope for the best. Um, the other problem with the aerodynamic side of things is, as you can see, uh, the access panels to the motor are a little bit poor. So for example, that allows you access uh, to the oil tank and they're on uh, little screws with springs or spring-loaded screws for want of a better word. Uh, you just need a little multi-tool or a screwdriver to get access. Uh, not a problem, but of course you can't get all the way around the motor and if you want to get all the way around the motor, you've got to undo all of these catches here and then, and then on the other side, because that's a one piece uh, rear deck for the motor. And it's just a fact. So consequently, no one really does a DI with these aircraft and looks all the way around the, uh, the motor. Now, is that a problem? Well, you know, it's probably, it's unfortunately with aviation, all these things become binary. You know, it's, ne it's never a problem until, guess what, it's a problem. And what people tend to do is they tend to say, 
what I'm going to do is I'll fly for five or ten hours and then I'll take the deck off and have a look, a good look around the motor. But of course, for an instructor, you'll get through five or ten hours maybe every couple of days. But for a private individual, he may not actually take the, the, that decking off the rear motor the rear motor there's not a front motor but off the motor uh from one year to the next being truthful so that that's a, again in respect to magni magni have made a much better uh design than autogyro in that respect and that's the cons on the Cavalon that I showed, uh, you couldn't see the covers because I'd taken the cover off to show you the 915 engine, but it's the same story with Cavalon as it is with Calidus. So that's with the canopy open. You can see that it hinges. It's actually on two hinges on the other side, and this is a little strap uh, that retains the canopy from uh, effectively stressing its um, hinges too much. The, the cockpit layout is very, you know, familiar to anybody that's seen Autogyro. So the layout is, you know, all the same with uh, airspeed indicator, altimeter, uh, fuel uh, level, rotor RPMs, and then engine T's and P's, mags and masters and uh, some switches for fuel pumps and so on down here. Throttle quadrant over on the right. One thing that you've got to be very careful of if you buy a second-hand Calidus is that this has got um, an instructor throttle in the rear, and you can see that this huge rod that goes from the throttle all the way backwards, there you can see it quite well here, when people get out of the pilot seat, which is in front, what they tend to do is push off that side and sometimes they can lean on this linkage and it's only very light alloy, so it's obviously uh, going to bend. The other thing about these, the, well, I've shown you here about the, the, the pins in the bodywork. Now, another thing that you've got to be careful if you buy Calidus second hand, if you buy one that's been operated particularly off grass, in the summer people taxi in that condition with the canopy open. And if it's on bumpy grass, uh, the canopy bounces up and down and basically tries to pull the uh, hinge out of the out of the bodywork. It's just bonded bonded into the body, and it pulls out. This body is another monocoque with the rotor uh, mast and tail. Uh, actually, the the rotor mast and tail for Calidus are in one piece, where they were separate in Cavalon, uh, but they all mount to the bulkhead of this monocoque. Um, also here we can see there's a lot of strapping here. Now, this strap to the pilot seat is effectively the only thing that stops this seat falling onto the stick in the rear. So it's definitely something that you need to check very thoroughly in a daily inspection because if that if that little i mean it's quite a strong piece of strapping with re a relatively good connections but that if it breaks then it's going to fall onto the rear stick and that's definitely uh, not a good thing you saw me then turn on the altimeter and the airspeed indicator because they're digital gauges in this generation of aircraft, which is common 
to uh, cavil on and actually the sport also you'll see that in the sport when we come on to it uh, i'm told that autogyro are going to stop doing these digital uh, instruments because they're very unreliable so that's something to be again mindful of if you intend to buy on second hand the reason i'm showing you this is because the pedals don't adjust in calidus what you actually do is remount the backrest of the seat uh, forward or backwards to push yourself forward in the seat or or allow you more more leg room so that's how that uh, adjusts there in terms of cabin space in the rear so storage it's not great actually in colorless what tends to happen is you tend to sort of really well first of all the rear seat passengers get a little bit uncomfortable because that is a fixed angle of the seat back and seat floor and you tend to be you tend to have a lot of weight on your lower back and you and your knees are kind of quite raised and you can probably fly for about 40 minutes to an hour and beyond that you get super fidgety especially i mean i'm 49 years of age and probably like most of us you know you get the odd back twinge when you get to my age and i'm sure that's never going to get any easier as we get older um and it's just not not great if anybody offers me a lift in a calidus i always ask if i can fly or make an excuse to truck to fly uh, rather than sit in the passenger seat and that's just from a, a pure comfort point of view they're just not nice uh, you can see this panel over here that's where people plug their headsets in uh, in the in the in the rear and uh, the headset plugins in the front for the for the pilot baggage wise you tend to put stuff you tend to stuff sacks like you know little bags down the side and, and rest your elbows on them there, there is a bit of room for that but otherwise uh, there's nothing that you can that you can there's no way to put anything other than uh, there are in the front let me see if i've got sorry, let's, let's show in the front yeah here you go so in the front there's some little sorry this is in the rear little storage cubby holes in the in the rear and there's some little cubby holes uh one side and then the other for for charts and maybe a bottle of oil or something but not not huge finally and this is probably the, the worst feature of calories. And that is how you gauge how much fuel you've got on board. And it's an enormous design flaw. Basically, that is the site window, if you like, for the fuel tank. Uh, it takes 75 litres of fuel. But the problem is that over time the fuel tank debonds from the external window and as you can see on this film and i think the clip's reasonably cl clear you just can't see how much fuel you've got what you end up doing is you get your mobile phone with the torch you're desperately trying to see or you know rock the aircraft to get the fuel to move around and actually the fuel level is where my finger is but you know it's not it's certainly it's certainly not obvious and the problem is you know obviously running out of fuel is definitely going to ruin your day in uh, in any aircraft and the fuel gauge it's not too bad but you know, if you're going to fly, unless you're going to fly the thing on full tanks all the time, which is, you know, wasteful, you can never be totally sure how much you've got on. And then obviously that really, really does um, 
limit your flight flight planning. I, I, I'm a I'm re very very disappointed um, with that aspect of of Calidus. The other element to, to note, I guess, with Calidus is that the undercarriage is a little bit narrower than the undercarriage of Sport and um, and Cavalon. And for some people, especially when they're new, uh, they, they, they get a little bit uncomfortable with that. And it has caused a few problems uh, in the past, especially ground handling wise. So there you go, there's the enclosed aircraft from Magni and Autogyro. Any, any questions quickly on those? No, not really. If you have any questions or anything comes to mind, fire in the chat or on the Q&A and I'll pick it up. Right, okay, so open aircraft. Uh, effectively, open aircraft, Magni and Autogyro, you've got M16 and then MTO Sport. So M16, there's an M16. You'll notice again uh, the straight keel. I kind of like straight keel uh, aircraft. It stops this over rotation, which is definitely uh, a failure for some people, or rather the cause of some people's demise. The one thing that I don't particularly like with M16, and this photograph is a very, very good uh, illustration of it, is just the rear, the way they've packaged things like fuel pumps, some of the electrics and the silencer for the motor, it just looks kind of half finished or I almost want to use the word bodge, that it isn't bodged. And in actual fact, a general overview, I would say that I think generally the engineering level of Magni aircraft versus Autogyro, I think some of the attention to detail overall on an engineering level is, is better, but it's just, it just looks unfinished. And if you ever see an M16 up close, especially with the exhaust silencer, uh, which has only got one, it, it's almost like you think that part of it's fallen off because it's so, it's so unfinished. It's just a bit of pipe. Um, and it's clearly uh, meant to have an additional piece of pipe attached to it, but they've either saved a bit of money and not bought that pipe, or I don't know. It's just, it just looks unfinished. And when you see one in the flesh, you'll definitely uh, see what I mean. Okay, rotor for M16 is consistent with M24, uh, heavy rotor. The stick force actually in M16 generally feels less and I think that's just the mechanics because it's not got that central you haven't got two stick where's my there you haven't got two sticks that then pivot in the center you've just got a central stick and they tend to work a little bit more efficiently um, but basically uh, the stick forces are, are, are of a, um, they're of a magnitude higher than, than they are in Autogyro. Charlie's asked me if I've seen in a Silverlight AR1 up close. Uh, I haven't, although when I look at a 2010 Sport, as they're called, Autogyro Sport, they look very similar, so I'm not entirely sure how they fly differently. Um, my plan this my plan actually in 2020 had been to come to all of the US shows actually um, and do some flying of some American gyroplanes because one of my thoughts from a, um, a business point of view had been to see whether we could um, bring some US machines to the UK, but 
uh, because some of these aircraft in England are actually super expensive, actually. Um, but but obviously the, the coronavirus has completely uh, destroyed uh, that ambition. This is the interior of what they call M16 Plus, which has got a 915 motor. You'll also notice that it's got a lot more uh, flat screen uh, to it. Now, I'm just going to show a couple of films so that we can just get a flavor for the different iterations of these things. Again, I don't really like these, I really do not like the whole, uh, you know, panel where you've got to start reading gauges. You know what, I mean, I much prefer, and you'll see when I stop sharing this and go to this, and there's the original, there's an original Magni M16 with, you know, a very similar, albeit slightly altered positioning to the M24. So you've got that Rotax flight at some warning gauges, and then just the primary flight instrumentation. You can see that the screen wraps around a lot more uh, in M16 uh, versus, uh, well, as we'll see a little in shortly, the Sport. That gives very, very good uh, pilot comfort. You can fly in an M16 with uh, no visor on without any problem whatsoever. Uh, they trim very well, actually. So they're very stable in pitch. And they're probably my favorite open tandem aircraft. You definitely feel as if you're sat inside an M16 versus uh, an auto gyro sport. I'm just going to give you another film to look at, which is with a, a, a more, uh, a newer spec version of an M16. So here you go, there you go. Look, this is, this is one, as you can see, that has got that, um, digital, so uh, horizontal situation indicator, uh, moving map, altimeter and airspeed, compass, and then some in engine instrumentation uh, digitally represented. And uh, again, here you can see just how much that screen uh, wraps around. It's quite a, it's quite a nice environment. And, and actually, when we're in the air, you'll see that, I'll just fast forward it, you'll see that there's a little bit of stick shake on this aircraft, but you know, you can you can fly the thing kind of hands off look as this guy is, and you know, you're not departing from control flight. The trimmers on Magni aircraft are sort of a worm, an electric worm uh, gear that winds the cable. And what that means, unlike autogyro, which is done on pneumatics, the problem with the pneumatics uh, is that the, the systems are constantly uh, leaking air. And as a result of it leaking air, um, you're constantly having to retrim all of the time. Uh, you can see that the pre-rotator is still the same as it was on M24 with a huge lever. Uh, VNE in M16 is 100 miles an hour, um, but it is quite a nice place to be, actually. So I'd rather, if I was going to buy uh, an open tandem trainer, I'd probably buy an M16 over a Sport. This is a sport. Now, the new 2017 sport is very much changed from, this is what they call 
a 2010 sport, which looks very similar to an M203. And with 2010 sports, you definitely get the impression that you sat on the aircraft because where that bodywork is sort of shaped out, that's where your bottom is. So if you're a nervous pilot, especially in the early days, with these aircraft, you almost feel like you're about to fall uh, over the side. They've helped that quite a lot with the addition of these uh, sidebars in um, 2017 sports, as they call them. But nevertheless, uh, the whole thing just looks totally different. It's got sort of a, a corporate style sort of nose where it's got a similar, you know, similar look to, if I bring you up to Cavalon look, it's a similar, you know, three LED uh, lights in the nose. Um, and it's quite a nice, quite a nice thing. They've, they've bring up my own uh, video of it and we can, uh, we can have a look, stop sharing that, bring over to this, there you go. So you can see they've also tried to make the windscreen bigger there on the other side, just for comparison. That's actually an MT-03, but to all intents and purposes, it looks pretty similar to a, what they call a 2010 Sport. Uh, so the windscreen does wrap around a lot more and these sidebars definitely give, uh, certainly a passenger, a greater feeling of uh, security. Obviously, you fly these from the front seat uh, rather than um, the rear. The rear is for instructor use. And if I look at the panel, this was a very, this was actually one of the early sports that got brought into the UK, very basic, uh, very basic panel, <clears throat> which actually for a trainer is fine because, you know, less is definitely more in a training environment. And if we turn on the electrics, you can see altimeter and uh, airspeed indicator. Now, if you're in the market for one of these, um, don't buy one with this instrument with these instruments they're definitely being changed they've been nothing but pain and of course if you fly anywhere and your altimeter or your airspeed indicator are not working it's not a great idea i mean bear okay what do i think if you're an experienced pilot and you're looking out of the window you probably you know you're going to be able to fly but just because you can doesn't mean to say you should and especially if you're a newer pilot, not having those primary instruments is, is not necessarily great news. Uh, standard kind of fare, this uh, was double-sided kind of um, Velcro and there was um, a little uh, iPad mini that went, that was attached there for navigational purposes and that worked fine but all the rest of it is very you know we're kind of looking almost we could be looking at a calendar stash or a um a sport you know um, a cavalon dash there with all those instruments the pedals are just on 2017 sport by that little knurl knob in the middle and it pulls the whole pedals towards you one thing to note with 2017 sport and the 2010 sport are that the rudder pedals are like an organ so there you go i'm just pulling them pulling that lever and the whole thing moves on that carriage that carriage by the way is notoriously unreliable so again if you're in the market for these things uh, you need to get some assurance if you buy them new that that problem's been fixed uh, because what happens is that the, the pedals effectively fall off the runner. Uh, and then I'm not entirely sure how secure 
the pedals are in the aircraft. You certainly wouldn't want to start a flight in that situation. They, for 2017 sport, they've got this sort of control module, shall I say, on the left-hand side. Uh, up front, you've got a choke, throttle and brake, and then you've got, th this has got blanks because it's a very basic uh, aircraft with heat seating, uh, pneumatic lumber, and then seat height adjust adjustment on the button. Uh, and then in the rear, which is kind of nice, you also get an instrument set. Now I say it's nice, obviously if you're an instructor uh, like I've been, uh, it's a lot better than trying to peer over the shoulder of the of your student to see his instrument uh, for, 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 for whatever he's trying to fly. You also have a set of magnetos and a, and a master so that you can get the aircraft started initially which is always a student faff in the early hours. Um, but it, it's also quite nice for a passenger because it almost gives them something to get involved with. And also, let's be honest, in the early days, you know, you can say to your wife or girlfriend or friend, you know, look, if I'm on final approach, for example, you know, I'm referencing this airspeed and, you know, if you tell your wife to give you a reminder, if you're flying outside of a set of parameters, you can guarantee she'll be all over it and just constantly on your case, telling her that you're not doing what you should be doing. Keeps her involved, keeps my wife delighted. Uh, the other thing about the rear actually of sport is that there isn't a huge amount of room to the rear windscreen. And one thing that isn't that comfortable is that the airflow can set, especially if you like flying a little bit faster, the airflow can create quite a horrible resonance off your helmet in the rear, so that you kind of get just constantly buffeted around, which you don't tend to get in M16, uh, which is the Magni product, as you'll remember. Uh, you've also got the, the, the control box on the left for the rear, same, same set of stuff. Obviously, heated seats is quite nice in an open aircraft if you're in a, a cooler uh, northern European country. Uh, and push rods, not cables on sport. If you look, Compare, ah, this is interesting. So what I wanted to show there was the fact that the weight limitations are different on 2017 Sport versus, so let me just get to the bit. So here you go. So, this 2017 Sport was a 912 engined aircraft, and it has, as you can see on the placard, a 500 kilo limit. The empty weight is 285, meaning you've got 215 kilos available weight. Now that's not too bad until you realize that you've got a 90 liter capacity fuel tank and so that's going to weigh if you fill it to the gunnels then that's going to eat at least over 60 kilos of extra weight and now depending on your passenger or wife i don't know how heavy your wives are or your mates or whatever can start to get limiting especially because, and this is another thing I want to show you, because this is also a very, this is a snag waiting to happen. You know, I like to talk about snags. So in the front, that's the little luggage uh, box in the front. It's quite useful. You can get, you know, 
whatever you need to take, you know, a little bag, small little rucksack, um, some oil, uh, whatever, whatever you need is just easy just to throw it in the front. Now, what you have to remember is that sticker that's inside there, I'm not sure whether I get a great view of it. Oh, there you go, I do. So, see there, it says baggage load, the maximum is 10 kilos. But if you fill that to 10 kilos, it means that the maximum pilot weight is reduced by twice the luggage weight. So if I put 10 kilos in there, it means I must reduce the pilot weight maximum weight by 20 kilos. Now, you'll see when we run that, that the maximum front seat weight is only 110 kilos anyway. So what that means is if I fill that front box, with 10 kilos, the biggest pilot weight in the front can only be 90 kilos. And I am sure that people are flying these things out of limits regularly because they either ignore that or they don't realize that or they've not paid attention to that. It's the same, that effect is the same if you get a 914 or a 915 engine aircraft. It's just that the maximum all up weight available is uh, 560 kilos. Again, they've got 120 kilo, um, sorry, 120 miles an hour VNA. The other thing I wanted to show you is the tailplanes. That in the background is the old sport. This is the new one. Uh, the rudder area in particular is significantly smaller on the new aircraft. It's not really a problem in flight, mainly if you like doing vertical descents with not very much airspeed, it becomes a problem. Uh, they've got a little skateboard kind of wheel on the bottom here just to help with tail strikes. There's the old 60, ki 60 litres of fuel in an old sport. Uh, but in the new one, you've got, as I said, 90, you have got 90 litres. So a fair bit, fair bit more. Quite a nice, quite a nice thing, really. Uh, there's just the adjustment for the seat, for the pedals and everything in the rear. So yeah, there you go, there's 20, 2017 sport. Let me uh, share back to my PowerPoint. Now, as far as what they call 2010 sport or sport classic, I think they're trying to call it. Uh, yeah, ah, right, yes, okay, full movement of the rear stick. Let me uh, go back there, Peter. Yeah, okay, let me just tell you that's a good point. So, <clears throat> that is actually quite a good point. So, there is actually, you've reminded me of the major design flaw in 2017 sport. One of the problems is, is that if the pilot adjusts his seat to the maximum, uh, it, it is very, very limiting to the rear stick movement because the rear stick can foul. I'm just trying to find the bit in the video. You'll see it if you, yeah, the rear stick can foul effectively the back of the uh, seat in front. And, and that is not, that's not great. So you gotta be careful actually. A little bit it just you just need to make sure that the guy in the back actually is not at full you know he's not sat at the at the limit of of, of of where he can sit if that makes sense depending on what you need my advice if i was buying one of these aircraft and i was flying non-pilots regularly i'd just remove the the rear stick 
and that would obviously stop that problem straight away. Um, so yeah, 2010 sport, um, they're getting a little bit old. You can't obviously, well, you can actually buy them new. They're, they're a nice, they're a nice aircraft. They, they basically are, uh, where it all began for, for, for auto gyro. You do feel like you sat on top of the, of the aircraft, as I've already mentioned, but they're a very solid, uh, dependable aircraft. And I've got to say, as a training aircraft, my preference is a simple 912 engine uh, in a 2010 Sport because they're a lot lighter. They're probably 15 kilos lighter spec for spec than a 2017 Sport, which gives you a little bit of headroom payload wise. And a 2010 Sport will still do 120 uh, miles an hour VNE. They're a lot cheaper. They're very simple. You can see and touch everything. Um, and there's just less to go wrong. You know, the more complex these machines are, then that tends to snag you at some point. In terms of engines, we haven't really, we kind of brushed over the engines so far, but uh, all these aircraft are available with all of these engines, apart from Calidus is not available with a 915 engine, mainly because it won't package into the bodywork and also it already easily goes through VNE with a 914 so it's kind of slightly academic really. In terms of what these are, these motors, just to give you a bit of colour, so in the middle here you've got Rotax 912 ULS, 100 horsepower normally aspirated. For me, uh, in a training aircraft, that's the choice uh, engine. They're the simplest, most reliable, they're fairly bulletproof, and they run and run and run. If you buy a second-hand aircraft, uh, then you know, you'll know you see aircraft with 2,000 hours, and as long as the aircraft has been serviced at the scheduled times, no problem for, for that motor. Uh, the 912 IS is basically the same as the 912 ULS, except it's fuel injection. The fuel injection obviously is just a level of complexity, which adds very little actually. And for me, is probably my least favorite motor, just because it doesn't really give me anything, but it potentially on the downside, gives me a lot more pain than a 912 ULS. 912 ULS has got a primary pump that is manual and the secondary pump that is electrically driven. It does mean that's hugely reliable. It's not the same with the 912 IS, which has got an electric primary and an, and an electric backup. It does mean if you lose uh, alternator, you're going to deplete the battery and then the motor is going to stop for sure. 914, reasonably reliable, although there have been cases, and I'm not entirely sure if it's operator or maintenance driven, there's been cases where they've had problems with the turbo and it basically just vents the oil through the turbo and obviously at some point the motor's definitely going to stop. Um, but otherwise, a very strong motor, uh, reasonably reliable if you look after it, I think, and is a lot cheaper than a 915. And for most people in most countries, 914 power is more than enough. So, for example, 914 in a M24, M16, Cavalon, Calidus, you can only get it in, M, in 914 or Sport. 
it's more more than enough power. 915 motor is a really lovely engine. Um, I've flown it in Sport, Cavalon, and it's it's a great performer, but it's a very new aircraft, a very new engine, so reliability is is unknown really in the long term, and it's quite a bit more expensive. And of course, the problem with gyroplanes is because they're limited speed because of design in terms of stability, it's not as if the extra performance from 915 is making it, you know, a 160 knot gyroplane, because it isn't. You, you know, you fly that Cavalon with 915 power is still limited to 120 miles an hour in the same way it would do 120 miles an hour with the 914 motor. So the main benefit for 915 power is that you obviously get a greater uh, takeoff performance. And of course, it's also useful if you live in a very hot country or hot and high conditions, if uh, that makes sense to you. I've got a question, I saw. Let me just see what's in the chat. Uh, Charlie's saying, I've seen on some websites the 915 max power is time limited to five minutes. Yes, it is. And that's consistent, Charlie, with uh, 914. So what happens is, um, <clears throat> so Rotax 914 and 915, the extra power is basically inverted. It's basically, because they're turbocharged motors, uh, unlike these two 912 engines, which are normally aspirated, it basically allows you to access more boost pressure for a limited period of five, five minutes. So you get max continuous power, which is less than uh, emergency power, if you wanted to call, call it that, or takeoff power. And you go through a little detent on the throttle to give you the max takeoff power. And then once you come through the detent, back through the detent, then the power is reduced. I think normally a Rotax 914 is 100 horsepower uh, once you are not taking off, if you, if for want of a better word, and the 915 is 130 horsepower uh, max continuous. Um, now, you don't get taken by surprise, if that makes sense, because to be truthful, uh, if you take off on max takeoff power, then if you left it there, then there's two things that probably alert you to that, is either if you carry on climbing, you're gonna be at sort of 5,000 feet, which is not necessarily the, the, the usual height that people fly at in a gyroplane, they tend to fly much lower, uh, or, if you've leveled off, you'll be busting through V and E. And then if that, if neither of those have taken your attention, uh, then there's a there's an alarm that blinks on the on the dash to tell you that you need to sort out your, your throttle position. Because if you don't, then it alarms continuously, and the only way you can get that reset is via a Rotax uh, agent. So, sales and service, I've got to say, I'm obviously based in the UK, and so I don't really know what sales and service is like around the world. Ah, well, I say that. So, let's deal with Magni first. Magni is a very family-based business. It's not a business like Autogyro, which is really a a much larger corporate entity. Magni is very much a family, uh, family business. They manufacture a set number of aircraft, and I don't think they have really any plans to expand. So they sell what they can make. They sell everything that they can make. They're happy with that. They make their own rotors uh, and so on. 
and they're quite they're kind of comfortable with what they've got. So it's not as if if M16 or M26 becomes super popular, they're really going to be able to manufacture hundreds and hundreds of these. That probably just means that you'll wait a lot longer for them to be delivered. In the UK, the sales and service is actually quite nice. The two guys, uh, Andy Jones uh, is a nice guy. He's a pilot, he's an instructor, he's an examiner. He's very attentive. And, um, you know, normally customers from the UK, they get hosted in Italy, uh, shown around the factory. And then, you know, obviously they're dealt with in the UK when the new aircraft arrives. Service-wise, a little bit of a faff. There's realistically only one service guy that can deal with these. And I think at 1,000 hours, the rotors have to go back to Magni in Italy for a non-destructive testing just to make sure uh, there's no cracks. Um, but otherwise, not bad. I don't know what it's like in Italy. I don't, I, sorry, I don't know what the service is like in the rest of Europe or in America or in Australia. But I imagine if you have to take your rotors and send them back to Italy like we do in the UK, just logistically, it's just a, a, you know, a little bit more of a lead time, I imagine. But based on the fact that they're a family orientated business, uh, which means that their sales ambitions are not that aggressive, I would suggest that around the world, their sales and service process is probably a little softer, shall we say, than Autogyro. Uh, Autogyro in the UK, in terms of sales and service, has been, I'll answer that question in a minute, Ken, about nine or five. Um, sales and service in the UK for Autogyro, uh, I've got to say, has been a shambles, in actual fact. A complete shambles. Uh, aircraft are sold and without a lot of care and attention. The handover process is, I suppose, random. Hit and miss is probably the kindest way to say. Service is better in the sense that there's a lot more guys that can deal with autogyro simply because the greater demand and sales volume has driven that. I know in the States, ironically, would you believe, I trained a pilot from the original um, uh, Autogyro USA dealer in Florida, which was Cloud9. And I have to say, the the word from that guy about what was happening over there uh, was horrific i mean i mean i've got to be honest i mean incredibly inc incredible stories of, in of incompetence actually and i think if you read the accident the ntsb accident report about chris lord then that paints a fairly bleak picture. And I'm not entirely sure that some of the messages that I hear from the current people, which actually I think fundamentally Autogyro USA are the same, I'm not, you know, I'm not particularly over impressed with them. Uh, and, you know, you can, I guess you could address that directly with them and they could address your concerns or not, but. You know, I, I just think it's incredible that the people that get chosen. I mean, originally they had a Brit over there, a guy called Andy Wall, that has literally been around the houses to every manufacturer. And I'm not entirely sure that he was alone in in the pro in you know in making the problem. And actually, I'm not entirely sure he didn't move on because he could see a problem. But you know, there's definitely concerns there for me. Um, and of course, because the USA is a much bigger territory, I imagine that individual dealers that are having to deal back with Autogyro USA as the importer 
I mean, I guess they could speak for themselves what, what their support has been like from the importer, but I think the importers have got fundamentally some wrong people there, but that's just my own opinion. Uh, getting back to the question that Ken's asked me, would a 915 allow for a shorter takeoff than a 914? Absolutely. Uh, 915 actually, in terms of its performance, is if that is your need, is the biggest game changer as far as gyroplane is concerned. It, in the past, I would, and in fact, I've made a video where I've said a, a gyroplane isn't really a short takeoff aircraft because you know you need a reasonable amount of ground run before the thing will unstick and then gain enough airspeed to get you outside of any kind of um, high velocity curve issue. But 915 has really got a lot of thrust uh, that you can utilize if you're experienced um, and, and get airborne and, and climbing out. I don't mean just unstuck, I mean unstuck and climbing away at 60, 70 miles an hour uh, really, really quickly. I mean, for example, uh, 2017 Sport with a 914. If you say it takes, if you pre-rotate to any normal value, so, because uh, obviously these can pre-rotate to 320. And actually with the smaller engine, you can't make the most of that because all that hap what actually happens, and you can watch my own videos on this, when you pre-rotate to the higher values, it just creates a lot of drag if you pull the stick back. So, and the, and the smaller motors can't really overcome that drag easily, but a 915 can. So what you find is, whereas with a 914, um, with a normal payload on a, an ISA condition kind of day, um, let's say you take 400 meters to get, you know, it's clear in 50 feet. With a 915, you'll, you'll do it easily in 200 meters. Now, obviously, <coughs> excuse me, I don't necessarily recommend <laughs> you line up 200 meters before the trees because psychologically that's a lot of pressure. And of course, you know, from an airmanship point of view, when, do you, when are you gonna knock it off? But, it, you, but you will make significant gains with a 915. Uh, finally, just wanted to talk about this because this is a little bit of a smug thing that uh, Magni uh, or Magni pilots uh, introduce, which is their uh, stability of the aircraft. And it's nothing, it's nothing actually particularly sophisticated. And it's definitely something that Autogyro have, 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 have moved towards. Basically, the pitch stability uh, of Magni is driven completely by the mass of the blades. And the total mass of the blades really does affect that pitch damping because the extra blades mass increases the inertia. And that gyroscopic procession as the blades are, are flapping to equalize lift left and right, because of the fact that there's 90 degrees lag in that gyroscopic procession, it's felt in the pitch, it's felt in the pitch axis. So what I mean to say is because that blade is so much heavier, it resists that it resists. Uh, the gyroscopic procession, and then you feel that in in pitch. So it isn't anything particularly, you know, it's not, I mean, look, it's probably, it's clever design in the fact that it's understood and it's being utilised to an advantage or to gain a characteristic, but it isn't anything, you know, there's no voodoo or witchcraft or or anything more than, 
the fact that the blades are significantly heavier than uh, than they are on the auto gyro products, or or at least the early ones. I think they're still probably a little bit heavier, but nowhere near as. I mean, for example, if you bought an MT-03 with the original Rose System One uh, or the, the, the first iteration of their blades, they were significantly lighter than they are now. Uh, in actual fact, once you can fly confidently, you, you actually prefer the lighter blades because the, the aircraft becomes more maneuverable. But but yeah, that's that's the way the market has kind of gone, really. Okay, so Q and A. Uh, I did have a few questions that were already sent in to me. So if you've got any more, type away while I'm chatting. But basically, uh, someone asked me about, I'm just gonna grab something here. Someone asked me, I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'm gonna share something else, this. There are a couple of questions, first of all, about insurance. And I've got some general bad news on insurance, and that is that generally I see insurance increasing. And that's because <clears throat> most people, or well, when I say most people, there's just a lot of these, there's a lot of accidents, basically. And because gyroplanes are not entirely uh, the biggest fleet of aircraft in the world, uh, underwritten by the biggest fleet of insurers, what's happening is one or two insurers are, are shouldering the, the, the complete blunt brunt of all of these accidents and they don't like it naturally and insurance premiums are going up. Tends to be between, in terms of a quick and dirty guide to how much premium you'll pay, it'll be broadly somewhere between 3 and 5% uh, of the sum insured. With, a, with broadly a thousand to 2,000 pounds, and you can convert that to a dollar amount or whatever uh, excess. I know I think in New Zealand, they're not insurable at all, I don't think, for whole loss. I think they'll insure you for third party, but they won't insure you for whole loss. Uh, so that's, you know, if you fly a Cavalon that's you know, 200,000 US dollars, that could be uh, expensive. Someone asked me about blades and the blade life. Uh, it is available in the Autogyro or Rotosport. Rotosport is just the UK agent um, of Autogyro. Of auto uh, it's in the maintenance manual. So, they're two and a half thousand hours ultimate uh, life limiting, which is the same as Magni in actual fact. Uh, but you'll notice that for the latest version, they've got a two and a half thousand hour life, but they assume 2.1 or 2.8, depending on whether you've got a 914, 915, or a 912 engine, ground air, ground cycles per flight hour. Now, what drove that was a study, a technical study done by the University of uh, Cranfield, and they looked at some blades that were cracking and found that the number of hours wasn't wholly the best guide. And that was because what they found was if you operated these things off a very rough strip or during every hour, let's for example say you were utilizing the aircraft as a higher aircraft or as something that was taking people for 20 minutes or half hour sort of experience flights, your hour of flying 
might include several takeoffs and landings. And there was one that had blade failure on a 2010 Sport, I think it was, that was operated in Germany and the blades had cracked and it hadn't done very many. I think I want to say it had done like 400 hours, or maybe not even, but it had got a very heavy uh, fatigue to the blades. So that's just something uh, to think about. The other questions I was asked about were uh, the situation. I've got your question, Ronald, I'll come to you in a minute. The, the, other, the other issue was, let me just, you can see my ugly face. The other issue uh, that I was asked about were, were the side-by-side -side, uh, aircraft and whether they made uh, good training aircraft or, uh, you know, initial aircraft to fly. And the one thing I'd say is that, let's just go back to the PowerPoint presentation. As you can see with a, well, this is actually probably the, the best view here, right? Because you can see side by side. When you fly these side by side aircraft, uh, two up or one up, it obviously has a huge change in the, in the, in, in, in how you feel the aircraft at the control. You know, there's a huge weight change laterally. And you know, obviously, when you when you when you're instructing, or when you're being instructed, you've got two people in the aircraft. Then you go solo, and what happens is your instructor is probably, you know, I don't know how heavy he is. Maybe he's eighty kilos, eighty-five kilos, ninety kilos. He jumps out, and now all of a sudden, instead of you know, look in a tandem aircraft. The instructor gets out, uh, yes, it makes the aircraft lighter, but it doesn't really change the balance very much. Here with the tandem, with the side-by-side -side aircraft rather, when the instructor gets out, it changes the balance quite a lot. And now some instructors, and I have to say, I think I have trained only two people in Cavalon. And as it happened, they were already pilots. So there was, a, there was a reasonable amount of comfort factor. And when I send students solo, I don't really add a lot more weight to the aircraft because in Cavalon, what the usual instructor trick is, and if you're in training, you'll have seen it for yourself, or if you're about to go into training, uh, you will see it. One instructor trick is to try and negate the fact that their fat body is no longer in the aircraft. They either fill it with fuel or they fill it with fuel and they put some ballast in the passenger seat. I don't do that. I might add a little bit of fuel, but I don't do it because I don't like the fact that it potentially sets up other snags. So what does that mean? Well, if you fill a cavil onto the gunnels, it will take a hundred liters of fuel. If you put a hundred liters of fuel in a cavil on, it feels very different. If you put ballast in the passenger seat, then you've got potential for a whole bunch of moving mass that potentially could be a distraction or if it completely comes loose, goodness knows where that's going. And I just don't want that snag. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the downside. Personally, if I was to advise any of you in training, don't train in a Cavalon, don't train in a Calidus, train in either a Magni uh, M16 or Train in a sport because their tandem, the balance is a lot better. And actually, they, they're just simpler aircraft to get on top of. The other good thing about being in the open is that you actually kind of 
get more confidence by being outside. And what I mean to say by that is, when you start flying a gyroplane, you're with the instructor, and that comforting feeling, you know, initially you're quite nervous, but you go through that cycle when you're with the instructor. With these enclosed aircraft, one of the problems is, is that, you know, the, the, the tail planes are relatively small. Aerodynamically, the tail plane gets a bit blocked. And, and also you can't feel so much when you're out of balance. You know, for example, if you imagine you fly Cavalon out of balance in your, this body is going to blank the tailplane, but you can't really feel it. You can see it because the yaw string will be off to one side, but, Annette, but obviously as a new pilot, that's not necessarily that intuitive and you can't feel the airflow. You know, if you fly a Magni, and certainly if you fly a 2010 Sport, if you are not in balance, you're, you just get blasted in the face with wind or at a less extreme uh, situation, you know, you start feeling it pulling on your shoulders. So it's a much gentler and more intuitive position. And I think you get into a lot less uh, issues or potential issues. Right, I'll just come to these questions. So Ronald, in the USA, to the best of my knowledge, only auto gyro can be purchased factory built. Unfortunately, everything has to be, everything else has to be experimental, 50% out of built. I believe it's a deterrent to the growth of gyro planes in the US. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, so two things, Ronald, is uh, firstly, you guys in the, in the US have got so much more freedom uh, than we do in, in Europe. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like in New Zealand and Australia. Um, probably maybe some halfway house, but definitely compared with places like Germany or the UK, you can pretty much do what you like. Now, I think, well, I know, okay, so I know for fact that prior to auto gyro um, bringing in these factory built aircraft, <laughs> and I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, you go and read, you go and read the Chris Lord accident investigation, and that Cavalon was being built by Cloud9. I actually knew that before. Why? Because the guy that I trained from Cloud9 over in the UK, he was basically a helicopter instructor and they were training some of their helicopter instructors to become gyroplane guys. And um, yeah, Cloud9 built that, that gyroplane. And I, I, would, I would bet my mortgage that if you went to any of those manufacturers and said, can you help me with a build assist program? I bet you don't do very much of the spanner work, to be honest with you. But I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's changed because of, you know, the, the, the obvious uh, issues in the past. I don't know. But um, yeah, Maybe it has held held it back slightly, Ron. I, I, you know, I don't I don't know, but I, but I would imagine, in truth, uh, there's still a greater freedoms beyond that. Um, and I think I would I would imagine that Magni may bring those factory built ones in because it would be very easy for them to to marry the US. With the, with the European kind of build process. Um, I'm not entirely sure how, the, you know, the, the, the US, I don't, what I don't really know actually, sorry I'm waffling a little bit, I'm not entirely sure why auto gyro get great attraction in those kind of areas for, for bringing in fully built aircraft. Maybe it's just because they've paid more attention to it in the UK and Germany and so they can make a more convincing argument. I don't, I don't know, but 
but yeah, there you go. I've got to say, so far, Autogyra Cavalon in the US just to me seems like a license to have an accident, really, because you know I think about a quarter of them have been damaged, um, and and I don't, and I think at some point someone's just going to say enough's enough, actually, um, and I think I also think that at some point, you know, look, that accident in Scotland maybe it's pilot medical could be medical issue i had a i had a student get killed actually he had a, a medical a medical issue and i hope for the instructor's sake because i know the instructor is a nice guy um but i think i think this could also be a watershed moment in the uk because it strikes me when you see these accidents they're all they're either students or low time pilots and at some point someone's that you've got to draw a conclusion you know you've got to call you've got to call this as you see it it can't be complete coincidence that it's always students or low time pilots that are that are having the problem uh right peter i train on mto apparently cavil on quite quick to pitch up on takeoff which may bite you if you're not ready or if you're not quick enough yeah peter if you watch the channel uh and look at all of these Cavalon onboard films I've made, you'll see that it's just poor, it's poor technique, it's poor training. Um, I bang the same drum. Some people listen, some people don't want to listen. Um, yeah, they do pitch up quickly. It's, it's caused for a variety of reasons, uh, not least because, I just, just for the sake of telling you, because I've got on my hobby horse. You've got a crank keel, which allows it to over rotate, I call it. You've also got a situation where because you've got the body work, the, you look, if you're in a sport with a, let me just try and, let me try and show you the, my arm, there you go. If you're, if you're in, if you're in an open cockpit aircraft, my elbow, I can hold the stick there though, and I can stick my elbow out and I can really articulate the stick with good shoulder movements. And that sh obviously shoulder is a big muscle. I've got a lot of strength. If I constrain my arm because I've got a door here, I'm now moving pretty much from the forearm only, which isn't as strong. The other thing is when you look at it from the side, that stick is real back here and I've got to get it over with just the forearm. So you haven't got quite the fidelity that you would if you open up the arm and move from the shoulder as you do in an open aircraft. Now, I'm saying that not because, <clears throat> why is this apparent to me and it hasn't been apparent to others? Well, the first thing is I tell you, generally what's the biggest problem uh, gyroplane community wise as you've seen i'm stopping sharing so you can just see my face because we'll have a chat well the big problem actually with gyroplane is that just people don't want to talk openly and honestly it's so defensive and you've seen if you've watched that film where i show the picture of the the scottish pilot it is cavalon that some of the, I mean, Chris Jones responded in defense of the pilot, saying that it actually wasn't too bad. Well, Chris Jones, Chris Jones has done 7,000 hours in gyroplane. He's probably the most experienced instructor in possibly even in the world. And he's defending that because he doesn't want to upset because lo and behold, Chris Jones taught that pilot. But the problem is, you got, you can't pull your punches in some of this. I know it sounds rude and it sounds aggressive, but fundamentally, you're going to save someone's life by just giving them an honest appraisal of their poor technique. Because if you just, you know, if you're just casual about it, you, it's it's exactly like I said on one of my videos. It's like. Going to, the, going to a bar with your mate in a, in a car, he, he gets on the gas 
and then you just wave him goodbye and, and, and let him go and crash and kill himself. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody wins in that situation. You'll feel bad for not saying, and he's obviously well. He's dead, and his wife and family are, are, are equally, you know, unhappy. But hey ho, people get people get along to get along. That's the problem. Peter, in Belgium, auto gyros don't exist. I need to fly on a foreign license. <laughs> So, so how does so that's interesting actually, Peter? Because of course, the other thing that I guess everybody's keen to happen is um, is this PAL V flying car. So that's not going to be flying through Belgian airspace anytime soon, I imagine. There you go. Anyway, uh, what other questions did I have? I have? Let me just find my email, and I'll tell you. What emails I have? Any more questions? Otherwise, I think we're done. Let's have a look. Right, let's have a look. I've got a slew of emails. Good questions. Right, here we go. I'm reading them from my email that I just brought up, so bear with me. Uh, so Andrew had asked me, which I responded to him privately, but I'll just cover them quickly because they might be interested. Uh, insurance suppliers, uh, I don't really know the rest of the world particularly. I think the States and New Zealand have got particular problems, uh, mainly because the market size is small and the accident rate is high. But in the UK, I would use Crispin Spears. Uh, they're a very good uh, insurer, uh, very reliable, and they are they know the market. If you crash, they, they, you know, they, 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 <laughs> dare I say, if you phone them up, and I have phoned them up actually for this, if you phone them up and say you've crashed your gyroplane, they're almost expecting you call uh, and they deal with the claim. Uh, do premiums drop significantly with the experience as in cars? Uh, they do, but the experience needs to be a little bit, you know, more than a year or so. It's kind of more on experience, flight hours. It's a, an aviation thing rather than a, an automotive concept, if that makes sense. Um, Typical annual maintenance costs for Calidus. Well, in the UK, and I'm not entirely sure if this is the same in, in the States or, or over in um, Australia and New Zealand, but basically in the UK, for most private individuals flying, you need to, you need to get the thing looked at every 100 hours or yearly and you also need to get the permit to fly renewed. And you tend to tie those up together for a private pilot. So you get the annual done with the 100 hour service and it costs about a thousand quid. If you wanna look for one of these aircraft in the UK, you go to a website called A4S, that's A-F-O-R-S dot com. That tends to be where they get seen. Or you could ask me, and I'll point you in some direction. Um, does the insurance cost differ with particular models? It's mainly on some insured for the whole. That's the driver. So if you insure a Cavalon, it costs more than a Sport, but mainly because the Cavalon's twice the cost of a Sport, basically. Payloads, yeah, they do differ, as I've explained. Um, I mean, mainly the best payload will be a Sport 2010 with a 912 motor. That would give you the biggest payload, basically. Uh, are they targets for theft? Not particularly. Blades, I've talked about the life of the blades. And the maintenance you can do 
without an engineering qualification. Let me just share the appropriate screen. This one here. Basically, you get what is called the maintenance manual. And in the maintenance manual, it tells you here what you can and you can't do. So here, look, pilot maintenance, uh, page 11. And broadly speaking, let me just get to page 11. So pilot maintenance, here you go, permitted pilot maintenance. Obviously, this is a UK document relating to UK uh, things, but it's all in the document. So it's not, um, the good thing is, it's not ambiguous, certainly not in the UK. And I would, I would personally, my view would be, if you are in a territory that doesn't have a full set of documentation, default to the UK because we tend to be more restrictive than less. And it's probably not a bad thing to be constrained than given free reign, certainly when you're an experience. Uh, yeah, Ron, Thanks for the thanks for the kind comment. Uh, yeah, when I come to the US, I might tell everybody I'm coming, and <laughs> just so that everybody that everybody that runs me over in the comments and gets all stressed can come and punch me in the face in person. But yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to come over to Oshkosh maybe next year if we've got no virus. Um, yeah, I'll have a look at that. I'll have a look at Henry's. Cheers, Ron. I appreciate the, the kind comments. Um, so yeah, if there's any, any more questions, let me know. Otherwise, ah, yeah, David, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. <laughs> David saying that the Scottish pilots videos are being taken down. Yeah, so basically, there's an element of me that feels slightly guilty about it, but let me tell you. So, this guy's films, of, 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 they have featured on some of my films before, mainly because he's just, his takeoff technique, and actually his landing technique is, is pretty poor. And incredibly, he has been revalidated at least three times. So it's not as if he's not had opportunity to be with an instructor and get on top of it. And if you watch some of his films, actually, I didn't post in my film something that basically shows him breaking the air navigation order because he's doing a fly past his own house, I presume, at naught feet. And I mean, the point is, David, is that, and as we can see by literally within a week of me posting a Scottish pilot doing something that wasn't great, guess what? Another Scottish pilot gets killed in the Highlands. Now, granted, we've got no idea what issues that Scottish pilot had, but, you know, what can you do? You can... Gyroplane pilots... In fact, wait there. I will, I've got another document that's a long one. I'm going to have to do a bit of searching, but I will find it for you. This is an engineering uh, it's actually a doctorate an aeronautical doctorate uh, paper, which I have access to, and I will share with you because it's important. So, 
it's actually nothing to do with flight safety. It's to do with aeronautical. It's, it's a, this is an aeronautical doctoral doctoral paper that isn't available to everybody. It's been shared to me by the doctor of engineering. Now works for. I be, well, no, they don't work there now anymore. Actually, so this person is a is a is a PhD in uh, aeronautical engineering. And they did their PhD on gyroplanes, on uh, aerodynamics of gyroplanes, and they proved for once that the CAA study that was done by Glasgow University back in 20, well, it was released in 2010, but it was a, a 10 year in the making paper. The Glasgow University study is controversial because it suggests that the tailplane has no effect on flight stability. This paper that was done two years ago, I think, proves otherwise. Now, part of it shows flight safety of gyroplanes and it uses it uses data from the CAA on number of flight hours, fatal accidents per million flight hours. Now, embarrassingly, the blue line is autogyros. The red and the green line are microlites and gliders. So they're not even helicopters or fixed wing that gets a little bit skewed by commercial air travel. These are micro, sport microlites and sport gliders. And as you can see from the, from the scaling, microlites and gliders don't even appear on the scale because autogyros have got so, such a bad accident rate. And bear in mind, this is fatality, it's not even accidents. So I know that, look, I know myself. I know that I am in some ways, no, 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 David, I know you're not blaming me. I'm just, I'm just saying, no, actually you can, if you, sorry, if you get, so that, if you're talking about the, the video that I posted and you're in the UK, all you need to do is get a, um, you know, access via a proxy service. So it suggests you're not in the UK. What he did is he basically, he sent a copyright claim to YouTube. And because in the UK territory, our copyright laws are slightly different from the US, um, it's taken down. It's not available to viewers in the UK. But if you get, if you go via a proxy server, and say that you're from America, then you'll be able to see you'll be able to see that video. But the but the fundamentals of this, I I know myself that I I just say it without a filter, and look, that's to my detriment in many forms and many walks of my life, not least when I was motor racing, for example. But um, you can't pussyfoot around these some of these issues because it kills people. And I know from bitter experience as an instructor pilot, my student, he was a, an older guy, I think he was 79. He was literally doing his last hour of solo uh, flying and about four, three or four weeks before, actually, and this is the thing that is the shame. About three or four weeks before, he came to the flying club and he got a towel wrapped around his neck like this. And he was a well-spoken gentleman. I mean, he was a super nice guy. And, you know, look, flying clubs, I'm sure, all around the world are exactly the same. We take the piss. We have a lot of banter. And I said to him, I said, what on, I said, what on earth do you look like? I said, I said, 
I said, you haven't come to the gym. I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, he said, oh, I'm ever so sorry. So I was, I was walking and you'd never believe it. I fell over in the lane. And I said, oh, I said, uh, are you okay? He said, wow. He said, uh, I, I was picked up in the lane by two girls. They found me after about half an hour and uh, I was being unconscious. Now, you know, I thought that he's exaggerating the time and, and, you know, all I said was, well, you know, are you okay? Oh, I've just got a bit of a stiff neck. And I think, I don't know, but I think that he'd actually had some kind of, you know, problem uh, with his circulation and he'd just blacked out. And, and that was the, you know, that was the, the early, early signs of his problem because apparently when the AAIB autopsy was done, he, he was in a very bad physical uh, shape from, from, from that point of view. And, um, and, and that's what they conclude. Now, of course, obviously, if you have a medical event, then it doesn't matter how great a pilot you are. You, you know, you just lights out and, and you're gone. But all that said, there's a lot of people that that, you know, there's a lot of gyroplanes getting crashed where that doesn't apply. Now, I hope for the sake of the instructor involved, because he is a nice guy in Scotland, that, that instructor, and he's very methodical. He would have definitely followed a process. And I hope for his sake that this accident that's happened in Scotland is um, a medical thing. But, but if it isn't, you wouldn't be surprised. And then that's not, that's not said to, to, to degrade or to denigrate the instructor. It's said because the, 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 the probability, given what we know of other accidents, you, know, you wouldn't be surprised if it was an engine problem and a two hour student pilot just didn't deal with it very well. Or it was a student pilot that had then decided on one of his solos, he was gonna find his own house and, and do a low flyby, for example. I mean, that, that kind of thing's typical. I mean, I had a student of mine, would you believe, he goes off on a solo and the next thing, I'm getting a phone call from somebody that had been able to read the registration of the aircraft because he was flying that low. And then, you know, and you have to take them to task and say, hey, when you go on solo flights, you've got to be sensible. Um, but hey ho, I suppose we'll all find out in due course. <coughs> Excuse me. The virus has got me. Right. It's nearly half past 11 in England. Uh, I've probably bored you all to death. Thanks for turning up. I hope I've given you some insight. Any questions, please just send me an email uh, or go via the channel. Hope uh, you've enjoyed it and I hope to see you again on the next one. Not sure what I'll do on the next one. Um, any suggestions, send me an email again and I'll try and cover whatever. Enjoyed your company. And uh, thanks for the feedback, guys. Appreciate it. It's all, all very kind and encouraging. Uh, the other thing to say, actually, before you all disappear, is that um, that buddy system, if you are an experienced pilot and you want to get involved, because that's one of the only ways or it's a thought that I've got to try and make the whole thing a little bit safer. Get in contact via the uh, email and I'll keep your name and contact on file. And if anybody's in your area or territory, um, I'll pass on the details. And, you know, obviously the arrangement that you'd have with the student or the new pilot is, is your own. Uh, but I think it might be a good idea to try and keep people safe because, you know, people are not keeping themselves safe. Ah, the other thing actually, 
check out my t-shirt let me just check it out i quite like this t-shirt actually if you want one let me know and i'll i'll get one sent out to you obviously you'll have to pay for it but I, you know for for whatever, whatever i pay i'll pass on the cost to you again via email right that's enough chat from me I'm done. Enjoy uh, the rest of the, well, I'm sh I'll see you before the end of the year because we'll do another one. We do one pretty much once a month. Uh, but uh, stay safe in the virus. And if you're in America, of course, you might have any unrest that, from your election. I'm hearing, actually, that uh, the people in Venezuela are calling election for election fraud on you guys and they're 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 matting the tanks on the border who would have thought it right enough cheers guys take care